I see a lot of patients, and one of the reasons why they don't come seek urologic help for, you know, erectile dysfunction, abnormal anatomy, whatnot, is because they have this stigma, just like with mental health, like, that's not something we talk about. And that's just not true. If you have issues that takes your attention away from the things at hand, outcomes will not be good and your personal life will not be good either. And I think social media doesn't help either in a sense that, you know, nobody is going to post their down moments on social media. They're always going to post like these happy moments. But that's not reality. Nobody, nobody wakes up every morning and has a 100% happy day. Let the price list take it to the moon. Price list one day will be soon. What is price list? Hi everyone, to welcome to another episode of D Talk with Dr. Fam. So, you know, lately we've just been talking about disorder and then bringing on guests that has had procedures so that you can hear it from themselves. Because, you know, the human body, everybody recovers differently. Uh, the end result may be the same, hence the term, all road leads to Rome. But today, I, I want to kind of change topic a little bit, you know, and talk about mental health. Now, I know May is Mental Health Awareness Week, but mental health, I think, is one of those things that, especially from a guy's perspective, um, we don't tend to talk a lot about that. And what that does is it really does shut us down and does a lot of harm. And it can lead to marital problem, erectile dysfunction, and definitely decrease in testosterone. And so I think it's important that we at least dedicate one episode to talking about mental health and the stigma that surrounds it. So, you know, I see, you know, I've been doing penis surgery probably going on 15 years, something along like that. And, you know, countless, uh, we like just to give you a sample number, because in order to be good, you know, I have to, I love surgery in general, just any types of surgery, it, it doesn't really matter. But for me and my partners, we came to realization that there's just no one person that can be good at every single types of urologic surgery. And so for me, I think, you know, one of the gifts that I have is basically fixing penis, especially botch penis. And there's just something about doing that that just gives me a sense of purpose in life. And especially the podcast also kind of gives me a sense of purpose in life because I get to relay knowledge to a subject that is less and less taboo, but it is still taboo today. And so over the years, believe it or not, you know, working with children is easy because parents aren't concerned about stigmas. They're like, you know, this is just like if my own son had a penile issue, I would not be embarrassed about it. I would be like, let's go attack this head on. Let's find a good surgeon. Let's get this fixed. Or my daughter, let's say she has something, whatever it may be. Let's go find a uh, solution, whatever it may be. So from my parents' standpoint, that's very easy. This is geared more towards men because over millions of years, you know, men have kind of been grouped into, and this is across all cultures, you know, that we're kind of supposed to be the breadwinner and, and, you know, we're supposed to be the one that holds the strong face and you know, nothing bothers us when really in reality, chemical balance can happen in any person from whatever trauma. It could be from, you know, uh, war, it could be from just reading a news article. For instance, you know, I immigrated from Vietnam. I'm one of the original refugees uh, back in 84, where we, you know, went on a boat, got to Malaysia, and then from Malaysia, we flew here. And, you know, at that time, my youngest brother, who's currently one of my partner, he wasn't born yet. And so for us, and that's why I really feel the plight of what is going on in the Middle East and Ukraine and all that, because for us, it was my mom, my dad, and my five siblings. 
And, you know, at that time, when you get on the boat, I mean, we're not talking about carnival cruise here. We're talking about, you know, like a rinky-dink, quick boat. You basically took whatever little belongings you have and you get on the boat and you get out of there. So a lot of families don't make it. And so at that time, my f family, which I can't even fathom to this day, decided that, well, if we all travel together and if the boat capsized, then everybody perish. And so we did have some relatives that made it over here already. And so what we ended up doing was we split up the family. So then my dad went with my two oldest sister and my oldest brother first. And then we went and then me, my mom, my aunt, my cousin, and my youngest sister. And keep in mind, besides Brian, who's one of my partners, he's 10 years younger than me, he was born here, but the rest of my siblings were all really just one and a half, maybe two years apart. And I'll just diverge on that for a second. But, you know, in Vietnam, if I was in Vietnam right now, I probably would be a farmer. Uh, it's just the way the system is, you know. Uh, we, we I didn't come from a privileged background, and so... It's not here where basically, you know, you can work your way up. Over there, it's kind of, you can be as smart as you want, but if you don't have the right connection, um, it's just not going to happen. And so most likely I would have been a farmer with some buffaloes. <laughs> and so, but thank God, you know, we, my parents decided that, you know, that's how we're going to do it so that in the event that, let's say my dad's boat capsized, then my mom can still carry on with me and my other sis younger sister. And so, you know, thank God we all, my, my dad went first, and since he uh, fought for the South Vietnamese Army, you know, he was able to secure kind of a, a, a way to get to Malaysia first. And basically, after he got there, then that's when I'm not really sure like how, how all this worked, but that's when he kind of did the paperwork to kind of help us get to America. Because from Malaysia, then I think it was through a church group in North Carolina that helped us get, that helped get my dad and my siblings to America. And then from there, then they did the paperwork. And then from my understanding, uh, after the Vietnam War, or, you know, right after the, the fall of Saigon, the way it worked was that every country kind of took in X amount of refugees. And that's why you see Vietnamese, and that's why I have relatives, and why you see Vietnamese all over the world is because, uh, you know, they, it's almost like a lottery system where you get to go. Since somehow, since my dad served in the uh, South Vietnamese Army, he was able to secure a way to America. And then with the help of a church group and uh, up in North Carolina. And so once he got there, that's when he started the paperwork. And so my mom declined England and France and all that. Somehow she, you know, my mom is a Catholic. So somehow she just prayed and it just revealed to her that she wanted to come to America. She didn't want to come anywhere else. And so she told my dad, whatever you do, he needs to secure a way to get to America. And so then we were able from Malaysia, I'm not sure how long we were there. Keep in mind, I was really young. Okay. I was probably, I was, you know, I'm 45 now. So if you're talking about 83, 84, so I'm probably was like five. And so, you know, this is just kind of recollection of what I can kind of remember and what my parents told me. And then uh, I was able to make it to America. And then from America, we moved to uh, Oklahoma City where we had relatives to help us kind of uh, start, you know, start uh, the process of uh, assimilating. And so when I, you know, and that's just kind of a background story about, because I, on Sunday, I had read an article about just the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict. And one of the things I read about was just urban warfare, but with tunnels. And for some reason, even though I wasn't like actively in the war, but I do remember my mom telling me like I was sick 
And she was like trying to get me to the doctor, dodging bullets, doing all this. I mean, I can't even imagine. And, you know, hence Vietnamese, we have a term that's like six kids can't even take care of one mom, but one mom can take care of six kids. And so that's why my mom, she may have not graduated sixth grade or maybe sixth grade was the highest she ever graduated, but she is the smartest person that I know of. And so just, but the tunnel system, you know, I, you know, I remember growing up, I would listen to my dad about, you know, how hard the war was because of the tunnel system. And so when I read about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and about just the tunneling system and how dangerous it is, it just somehow, it came rushing to me, like, you know, I, for the people, the civilians and all that, the hostages, whatnot. And just the mental trauma from that, like, I just don't know how you even comprehend that. And, and I wasn't even actively old enough to even understand the tunnel system. However, I did visit Vietnam maybe five or six years ago, something along that line, and I visited one of the tunnel system, and my goodness, it is tiny. And I weigh about 180 pounds, and it was tough to get in there. And so, I, I, you know, and, and so I, I just, I try not to turn on the news. But, you know, what I wanted to talk about is, it's just, you know, about just mental health in males in general is like, we don't, we tend to keep everything bottled up inside until it comes to a point that it starts to affect your family life, your sexual life, uh, decrease just your testosterone, makes you not want to do anything anymore, but, but you don't want to really talk about it because... The, you know, it's better now for sure, but, you know, a few, just a, even a few years ago, it was just a stigma. And for me, you know, I don't really have, like, bad mental health issues, but, you know, after Hurricane Harvey, I just, it, it, you know, it took almost six months. You know, my house was damaged and all that, which looked just like everyone else. But I think Hurricane Harvey in 2017 you know, just, it took, I think, almost six months for the debris to be cleared up. And just imagine waking up every morning, going to work, going outside, you know, no electricity, nothing, and just seeing these devastated houses, you know, because in my neighborhood, there's a lot of older people who's been there for 50, 60 years. And, you know, luckily my house was built under the new code where it had to be built four feet up. And so, you know, we had some garage damage and all that, um, you know, which is no big deal. I actually, and at that time, we couldn't find any contractor to try to, you know, cut the, uh, I don't, it's not called plywood, but it um, skips my mind now what it is. But it's like this soft thing that, you know, that you can just break. And so where the water line was, you know, I talked to one of the contractor. He told me just go about two centimeter or two inch above that water line where I see it to help prevent mold. And so my dad drove down from Arlington to help me with that. And, and so, you know, we didn't sustain like a ton of damage, but it, but I, but my neighborhood did, it was just horrible. You know, you see these patients that are, I mean, I'm not patient, I'm sorry. You see neighbors that's been there for 50, 60 years and literally their house was just underwater because they're one story houses. And it, it was just unbelievably bad. And then at that point, it just brought out something inside of me where I just felt like, you know, like so anxious, like, you know, like, oh, my gosh, like what what's going on? You know, is this the sign of the ends of times? You know, you start thinking like the worst. And and, you know, and then I but being a guy and being from where I'm from, you know, we don't show signs of weakness. So I try to bottle it inside, and I kid you not, my wife had to call my family because I didn't even know it, but with a span of four months, I lost, gosh, I was like, I think 185, and I was down to like 128, and my siblings flew in for intervention because they would try to talk to me and like, hey, listen, there's nothing wrong with seeing a doctor for help. You know, it, it, you know it's just a chemical imbalance. You just went through a very traumatic experience. 
which was the Hurricane Harvey, you know, because the only one that I can compare that to is Tropical Storm Allison. But when Tropical Storm Allison happened, I think it was 2001, I believe, you know, that's when I first started medical school. So by the time I came down here, all that mess was already cleaned up. So I really didn't, you know, all, I, I heard stories about it, but I don't really get to experience it or had any traumatic experience with it. And so finally, I, I, you know, I listened to my family and I was like, okay, you know what, it's, it's, it's not a sign of weakness to ask for help. And so I did. I talked to my doctor and he's like, you know, you, you show signs of anxiety and that's all it is. And the reason why you probably lost a lot of weight is you just, you know, you're not hungry. Your heart's, I think my pulse was like running <laughs> like 130s. I got my heart checked out with the cardiologist. They, everything's fine. But at the time, it just, it was just bad. And so I, they started me on Zoloft. And oh my goodness, for those who have been started on Zoloft or, you know, kind of any serotonin uptake inhibitor, the first six weeks was horrible because it made your heart palpitate like even more. But then it wasn't one of those where you just woke up one day and you're like normal. But then I, I want to say around the six weeks mark was when I woke up. And I put on my scrub pants. And mind you, during this whole time, I'm still able to work. I'm not, I'm not saying like I'm like the unluckiest guy in the world. But I wasn't the go, you know, lucky, fun Dr. Fam. You know, I was just kind of just get to work, take care of business, go home. No social interaction. And I, I think that was a bad idea too, you know. And so I finally did. And then at six weeks, you know, I woke up. And it was like, you know, I was able to put on my scrub pants and I felt decent. Like I didn't feel this, we're cut, you know, the world's coming to an end and all this, you know, and then, and then, yeah. And then gradually it just kept getting better and better. Now, you know, there is side effects to it, which the biggest side effect is sexual dysfunction. And so, you know, it's kind of like you have to ask yourself, you know, which, you know, it's it, it's, it's kind of like with any marriage, right? You know, if you, if you have an understanding wife, then you, you, you can understand, you know, you're, if your wife can understand, then, you know, you, got, you just have to kind of balance it. And for everyone, it's different. I'm not a, a therapist. You know, I don't claim to be a therapist. But in this episode, I want to just draw to light that, you know, I wish looking back, I would have gotten help sooner instead of waiting until I was 128 pounds and I, nobody took pictures. Gosh, I wish I could have see it because my family literally said I look like death, like just skin and bones, you know, not like, you know, like tone and fit like I am now, you know. And so that's why I I try to be religious with exercise and all that. And, you know, and like I said, my doctor said, you know, it's not like you need to be on it forever. We just kind of have to figure out what's a, what's a good balance. And so that's, you know, that's kind of what I wanted to focus on today is I see a lot of patients. And one of the reasons why they don't come seek urologic help for, you know, erectile dysfunction abnormal anatomy, whatnot, is because they have this stigma, just like with mental health, like, oh, you know, I'm, you know, that's not something we talk about. And that's just not true. You know, urology is a field predominantly, for what I do anyways, predominantly is a male-oriented field. And we're here to help those things that nobody wants to talk about. And it's very tough. And I have to thank the Lord above for that. But I think I have a gift of being able to talk to guys to let them understand, hey, what is going on happens to other people. You're not the only one. And there's nothing wrong with it. You know, there's nothing wrong with getting whatever fixed. You know, you're not necessarily born like that. And what's interesting is, you know, my partner recently told me, he goes, you know, there's an article that actually showed penile size between races, the difference is really not what everyone thinks. I believe he told me the difference was like maybe around an inch. I know, at first thing you guys, everyone's like, no, 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 that's not true. But you know what, when I look back, I was like, you know what? 
He's kind of right, because when I do these buried penis surgeries, what I notice is in African Americans, for instance, when I try to bring the penis out, there's actually not a lot of penis that's that's in there that's able to be brought out versus like Asian uh, patients. You know, there's there's a lot of penis that can be brought out. And so, you know, I, I, I think there's truth to what he's saying. And and, you know, and he's reading this book call um, 4,000 Weeks to Live or something along that line. And and it's a book, you know, I haven't actually read it. I want to read it, but we were just talking about it. And he said, and this is my younger brother, you know, and he said, you know, when he read it, it just really put a perspective on mental health and life in which why do we always worry about things that are outside of our control? You know what I mean? Like, you know, there's no point in worrying about, you know, something that, I don't know, let's say you got audited or something by the IRS. Well, there's no point in thinking about, well, what are what, do, what is the IRS thinking of? You know, just provide them whatever documents they need and let whatever it is play out because by hyper-focusing on that one subject, you will end up costing deterioration in your other stuff, including relationships, including um, self-esteem, including all this, you know? And so especially as, as a surgeon, it's tough. It was very tough for me to come to realization that, hey, I can't, I'm not in control of everything. You know, for instance, when I operate, you feel like you're in control that there's gonna be zero complications. Now, of course, you always try to improve, and that's what I do. And that's the reason why when I started Crescent Urology, I wanted um, Crescent Urology Institute. There's a Crescent Urology in New Jersey, so I don't want people to get it confused. But when I started this with my two partners, what I said was that we should all be able to do general urology so that we can cover each other. You know, you know your partner may be sick, your partner may be whatever. You know, you, you have to be able to at least cover it. But we all need to kind of focus on one area, one or two area of interest that we like. And then you primarily focus your practice on that interest. And the reason of doing that is jack of all trade, master of none. That's the only way to be good. And so it's not that I can't do ureter or reimplant or all that, because trust me, when my partners run into complex ureteral reconstruction, I, I'm the one that they call to come help. Like, you know, I'm going to go on a tangent for a second. But yeah, a few years ago, we had a patient operate on multiple times for obstruction of her ureter. Finally, the ureter was just not usable. And so your option is to take out the kidney, which we don't want because she's young. She has a good kidney. Option two is use bowel. Well, any sort of bowel surgery, complication rate is going to be about 50%. And so, you know, and then it has its own issues. And so what we did was I harvested buccal mucosa, and my partner turned that buccal mucosa into ureter. And patient's doing great. And so, so it's not that I can't do other surgeries, but, and it was very hard to accept the fact that, hey, Dung, you can't do every single surgery and expect to do it well unless you hyper-focus on a specific area. So my specific area really is male and female genitalia and urethral reconstruction. I mean, we would do crazy gunshot wound through the urethra from the pelvis. I mean, those are, those are not easy surgeries, but we've done them. And a lot of these high profile cases that you heard in the news, there's a high likelihood that I was involved with it. And so, but the reason why I think that's possible is because I focused on myself first, where I said, okay, you're not perfect. You have weaknesses and you have strengths. So what are your strengths? And my strengths is genital reconstruction, urethral reconstruction, ureteral reconstruction, bowel reconstruction, well then focus on that. And that's what I do. So that's why I limit my practice to kind of just that. And every day I improve, I try to improve. Because honestly, I've been out of fellowship in 2013 and I probably only use about 30, maybe 40% of what I was taught in fellowship. 
And it's not to say that what I was taught in fellowship is not the correct way to do it. Surgery is a very dynamic field. It's not like changing an oil. Every patient's different. Every patient has different comorbidities. Penile surgery is really an art. It's, you know, everybody knows the basic techniques, but it's these little fine things that you do here, you do here, you make a cut here, you make a cut there that makes the difference. And for me, you know, the reason why I don't post my surgeries is, you know, A, it is a business and you, you know, you, you know, I've been working hard all these years to try to bring complication rates down to zero. That's the ultimate goal. Once I can bring complications rate down to zero, then I will hang up my jacket. But as of right now, we're not there yet. But I can tell you my complication rates really is really just wound breakdown. And, you know, there's biologics that can help with that. I won't get into all that, but then, you know, those biologics can be expensive. Insurance doesn't want to pay for it and this and that. And so, you know, but yeah, my really only complications wound breakdown. And then that area down there is not exactly an area that you can just air and keep dry and, you know, you get the gist. But, you know, but back to the mental health, you know, if you're kind of ruminating, think of it like you're trapped inside your brain, then you'll never be able to do what you can for your patients. Because when that patient is on the table, or when that patient visits you in the clinic, your focus should be that patient. But if you are afflicted with depression or whatever, and then you try to be tough about it, and be like, you know, oh, I'll just work it out or whatever. Believe me, you're not doing a service for your patient. And that's really not fair for the patient. And so really what I wanted to bring out today is I know it's not Mental Health Awareness Month, which is May, but I think mental health awareness should be to all the time, you know, and there should not be a stigma against that. If you have issues that takes your attention away from the things at hand, outcomes will not be good and your personal life will not be good either. And so, and I, and you know, and I don't, and I think social media doesn't help either in a sense that, you know, nobody is going to post their down moments on social media. They're always going to post like these happy moments, but that's not reality. Nobody, nobody wakes up every morning and has a 100% happy day. That just doesn't happen. It's up to you to tell yourself, okay, everybody has problems, but for this eight hours or whatever you're at work, you know, Treat, seek help, leave the problems at home so that you can focus on whatever it is, you know, whether it doesn't have to be healthcare, whatever it is, so that you can focus on the work at hand. And trust me, it took me a while to come to realization that if you don't focus on yourself, it's easy to say, but it's hard to practice. But if you really don't focus on yourself, I promise you, you're not going to be doing the best you can. And trust me when I tell you, there are people that want to praise you and this and that, and really it's for their own gains. For instance, you know, they're always praising you for doing a lot of cases. Well, that's because so that, you know, X plays can make money. Now, I'm not saying that's always the case, but I'm saying you need to think about that. Is the person that needs to the person that cares most about you, or at least the one that has to care most about you before everyone else, is the person that, that you look at in the mirror every day. And until you can get that person to care about you, nothing else will matter. So, you know, I really hope with this episode, guys can be more open because you, I can tell you countless guys that have cried in the office and all that just because they needed someone to talk to. And my line is always open. It doesn't even have to be you need surgery. If I see a high-risk patient, I will personally follow up with that patient uh, to make sure that they're doing okay. For instance, I had a patient that, you know, I discharged from a follow-up a while back. You know, he, he, 
you know, he, he got surgery, he did great, he's happy and all that. Well, his only sister just got murdered or committed suicide, something like that. Who's the first person he called? Me. And I picked up and I asked him, I said, why did you call me? He goes, you know, in a good way, like, you know, why, why pick me? Not like, you know, your, you know, your cousin or something like that, because I think that was his only sister. He said, because Dr. Pham, from the moment I met you, I knew that you were in it because you really want to see me succeed in whatever it is I wanted to do. And this urologic issue is holding me back. So the whole time you held my hand and you got me through all this. And the first person I thought about calling just so that I can talk. And so I told him, I said, listen, I'm always here to, to listen because sometimes that's all you need is someone to listen to. You don't necessarily need to start medication or this or that because I don't claim to be a, a, a psychiatrist. But what I do know is from personal experience, when you actually open up to professional help, you will feel better and you will start to realize it's not a stigma. Chemical imbalances happen all the time. It's when you keep keeping it bottled up is when bad outcomes will occur. And I can promise you that. And so, you know, it just happens that, you know, genitalia and erectile dysfunction is a big part of a guy's life. And so that really impacts them when, you know, whatever it may be, erectile dysfunction, penis too short, penis deformed from trauma, injury, I was just born with it, whatever it may be. You know, if I can help you, I will. And the majority of time, I can help you. I I don't ever remember one case where I'm not able to help you. Now, some is easier than others, but in the end, everybody can be helped. But it takes that guy in the mirror to tell you, hey, let's get some help. And, you know, and we work together as a team, right? You know, I treat the urologic problem while a psychiatrist helps you with whatever it may be. And then, and sometimes it's as simple as you just need to talk to them for a few sessions so that you can get to what is the trauma that is causing you to have this, you know? And then once you talk about that trauma and you release it, I promise you will feel a thousand times better versus trying to take on the fight and because I can tell you this, no surgeon and probably person, but I, I, I can speak from, from a surgeon standpoint, no surgeon has ever laid on their deathbed and wished that they did that extra case or they were that macho guy. But I promise you, they will regret why, why I didn't become this guy's friend. Why wasn't I there for my friend when he needed it or when she needed it? Why did I not focus more on me? Because no one's going to remember Dr. Pham and how many penis cases he's done. You know, what I want to be remembered for is what I did. You know, Dr. Pham has a charity to help children. Dr. Pham does podcasts to educate patients, just to educate patients. You know, I got a, from the producer, you know, I got a, li a list of nations that, that download and stuff. And, you know, 10% was from China. And so just the fact that someone, I'm able to hopefully help someone in China, they don't need to come to Crescent Urology. That's not the point. You know, I'm like way overloaded with business. If anything, I have to kind of slow down. The reason why it's hard for me to find a partner is because I don't want to just find anyone, any partner. I want a partner that lives with a Crescent philosophy which is patients are your boss. Without patients, we wouldn't be here. So, and it's nowadays, it's very tough to find surgeons that think that way, you know, and it's just the way I think surgeons are built. You know, they feel like they're in control, they're the best, whatever it may be, you know, but, but back to, yeah, back to the fact that I have listeners that are not even in Texas, that find it helpful, it just makes my heart feel that much better that what I'm saying is at least reaching people so that they can re-self-evaluate. Because remember, Father Time marches on. Whether you worry, you don't worry, it doesn't matter. Father Time marches on. Tomorrow could be anybody's last day. 
So I'll leave with this. Always remember, if you wake up, you have already won the fight. So no matter what you're going through, things will be okay. Every And know that everyone, regardless of social status, goes through the same problem. I don't care how rich you are. I don't care how poor you are. Chemical imbalances can happen in any person and it's out of your control. And if you don't seek help, all the money in the world is not going to help you. And, you know, another recent story that really brings this to life is Matthew Perry. I mean, gosh, 54 and he died. But then when you read his book, you know, he spent almost $9 million on just mental health alone. And the fact that he said he would trade in all the fame just to not have mental health already tells you how powerful. Just think about that for a second. He would trade in his multi, multi, multi million dollar residuals that he's still getting. And, you know, he wasn't married and he doesn't have kids. So, you know, who knows where, who's going to get the money. But the, my whole point is the fact that he even said that he would trade all this in just to not have mental health and to be able to seek health seek help, you know, that just tells you how powerful it is. And his legacy is not going to be known as he was a friend, he was on friends, for me anyways. His legacy for me will be that he created a center that helps patients with mental health issues. And that's what Matthew Perry will be remembered for. And I know he's probably looking down right now, smiling, hearing that statement. He wasn't known as Chandler Bing on Friends. He's known as the guy that set up a foundation to help other people going through the same thing. So I hope this episode really can at least get you to the point where you can live in the moment. Don't worry about things that are out of your control. Let, let things play out the way it's going to play out. And if you're bottling stuff inside, that's not going to do you any good. Seek help. Whatever that form may be, it may be a psychiatrist, it may be talking to a friend, it may be running for a jog, whatever it may be. But it needs to be a disciplined approach, not I do one day, I feel better, okay, I'm just going to bottle it up and kind of be a prisoner, my own prisoner, my own brain. And that's what I don't want guys out there doing because believe it or not, we live about seven to eight years shorter than women. And there's no reason for that. And a big reason for that is because we have this persona that we have to be tough, that, you know, oh, that chest pain, I was just working out a little bit, even though we know that heart disease is the number one killer of men. If you have chest pain, go get it checked out. If you have mental issues, go get it checked out. You never know what these professionals can do. That's what they do for a living. And that's what I hope you get from, from this episode. And so if you find this helpful and insightful, subscribe. We're on all the major platforms, podcasts, YouTube. Subscribe so that I can continue to do this, so that I can, and purely just to pass on knowledge that is mine, okay? Not, not anyone else's. It's just mine. Uh, that is based, you know, in, on, on science, of course, you know, and so I hope that, you know, you support this effort that I'm trying to do and so that I can continue doing this because to me, this is also therapeutic. Being able to talk about it and helping someone else to me is therapeutic. So until next time, well, Dr. Pham's going to sign off. And please watch this episode multiple times if you need to. Okay? All right. Well, I look forward to seeing you guys in the next episode. Dr. Fam signing we off. Let the price list take it to the moon. Price list one day will be soon. What is price?